Pastor Keith here, and welcome to another episode of Martin's Milkweed Meadow. During the warm and wet weather, aphids on milkweed is just reality. In fact, I know people who say that if you're purchasing a milkweed from anyone, that if it doesn't have aphids on it, it's probably been treated with chemicals. And that's something we never do here at the meadow, knowing that chemicals are going to be eaten by caterpillars and it's going to kill the caterpillars. And that goes against everything we're trying to do here at the milkweed meadow. So aphids are just reality, right? You see these little little buggers right there, there they are. So what do we do uh, when we get aphids? And as I said, during the warm, very wet months, like we've been experiencing here in South Florida the last couple of, of months, uh, when we get late August, September, uh, what do we do about them? Well, the first thing we could do is nothing. Right, so this is a pretty big, healthy plant, and you can see those those aphids aren't aren't damaging it. So one advice uh, that's typically given is just don't do anything. Let let nature take its course, because what's going to happen is critters like lacewing flies and ladybugs are going to come, and and they're just going to have a feast. Even those those. Uh, Little lizards sometimes, they'll be sitting there and, uh, and just munching away. So one thing we could do is just nothing. But what happens if they get out of hand? Right? What if uh, we see that they're starting to harm our milkweed and our milkweed uh, is, is in extremis? Well, we always have to be aware that on our milkweed we may have uh, monarch eggs and caterpillars and so Whatever we do, we never want to use chemicals, right? So, one thing we could do, and you see here, right, on the, there we go, there, so there's aphids, right? So one thing we could do, knowing that at the bottom, that the eggs are normally found on the leaves, here on the stem, we can just rub our fingers, right? We can rub our fingers, and, uh, and just, get rid of a lot of them that way, right? Just rubbing our, rubbing our fingers on our stem. Yeah, so our fingers, when we rub them like that, right, we're, they're gonna get a little yellow, and that's okay. That comes off with the soap, and some may think, yuck, I'm not gonna rub those aphids. Well, fine, let's just say, you can just leave them be, and that's gonna be fine most of the time. Or you can do, I said, the little little manual work, right? And just sit there gently, gently rub on the stem. You see, this is why we always have to be careful. What do we got here? We got a little itty bitty monarch, so we don't want to do anything that's going to be bothering him. Here on the stem, we got some more, so we can just uh, do that. So another thing we could do is uh, spray some water at the base. We got some oil now. We gotta have check to make sure we don't have any monarch on it before we do that. So a little spray, spray them off. And that uh, that really starts to annoy them after a while. So we can do that turn it off there, but you only want to do that, and as I said, after you've checked and you've made sure that there's no, uh, no caterpillars on there, and that's still going to probably do some harm if there's eggs. So, he so said, there's, there's always a cost involved. In, a, in what we try to do, anything other than nothing. And oftentimes, as I said, their mere presence is just part of the, the web of life, right? They mostly, can say, said, you can see this plant's just doing fine, and, uh, but if we 
want, we can just kind of rub our fingers very gently and cut the number down. But most of the time, nature is just going to do its thing. So what we've uh, also been doing here at the meadow, so here are our, our babies, and these are the ones that we hope to keep uh, pretty free from the aphids. Uh, we've got uh, trays of them here. We're trying another experiment too. You see this row here, and that's dill. And uh, we're trying some, uh, some dill, it's supposed to, be uh, something that the aphids really don't like. So we're trying to add some rows of, of dill uh, in between the trays of plants and see if that dissuades them. Little easy experiment. And on the plus side, dill is an attractor for black swallowtail butterflies. They like to lay their eggs and the caterpillars eat it. So it's a win-win for us uh, at the very least. We provide some food for the black swallowtail. What else we got going on in the meadow? Well, we've been at kind of doing a little meadow and more. So we've been growing from seed. This is a, uh, a senna here. You can see the, the yellow flowers, right? And it's a, uh, a privet senna. It's a native. And you can tell it's a native because the seed pods bend down just like that. And so this privet senna, uh, pri or privet cassia, as it's also known, it's an attractor for some of our sulfur butterflies. They like to lay their eggs on that as well. And we've also been collecting up pots and pots of a passion vine. This is corky stem passion vine. See there. In fact, if you look, we've already got eggs. There, see that little yellow dot? We've already got eggs on the corky stem. And two of our butterflies here in South Florida love the corky stem. The Gulf Fritillare uh, and the zebra longwing. Zebra, in fact, is the state butterfly here in Florida. So we've uh, gotten pots of it. And what I hope to do is uh, make some cuttings and grow some cuttings. We can add that into our giveaways for people that want to do more than feed the monarchs. They wanna to put together some little butterfly gardens. So we'll have to see how our rooting, and we'll follow along here on the video, how our rooting goes uh, as we try to grow more. And here's uh, more of our mother plants to take cuttings from of that corky stem passion vine. And so we've got those plants that we're working on and to add to the the milkweed meadow giveaways over time to be able to help people to grow and expand their butterfly gardens and we hope to be able to add uh, more host plants focusing on on host plants for your garden for your butterflies so So another thing we're up to in the meadow, you can see we've got this uh, tray here with lots of little holes. That's a coned container hold there. And these are our cone tainers. You see they've got uh, lots of space at the bottom uh, to pull up water from the tray. And they're, they're a good size. You can see that in my hand, right? Seven, eight inches. Uh, and we fill these with soil and it provides a huge setting then for the roots to grow down. Milkweed roots uh, tend to grow deep and then they self-water from the tray. And so each one of these is 96. And we've got a couple of these uh, to fill over the next couple of days. And then we'll be ready for planting and plant our next crop. And hopefully this one with the cooler, drier weather uh, will be uh, safer from the ravages of that yellow aphid that I showed you a little earlier. So I'm kind of excited. We're getting some fresh seed in, even from local Florida sources. And uh, we'll follow up here uh, a little later on as we get ready for our planting.
So I wanted to show you another part of the, the milkweed meadow. You know, it's part of a butterfly garden here. And we have lots of different butterfly plants in the garden that attract different kinds. So what you're looking at here is uh, a cycad, the only native cycad here in Florida. And it's called Kunti, Florida Kunti. You can see that there, give you an idea what the leaves look like, kind of palm-like, but it's a cycad. And the kunti is the only food for the Atala butterfly. You can see the caterpillars here, right? You see the caterpillars. Lots of them here on the kunti. They sure love it. And see if we can get a good picture here. You can see them, that orange with the yellow dots kind of a little bit in the shade, a little in the sun there, but, but they, uh, they love that kunti. It ends up kind of like this, little sticks, and they're done with it, but it grows back, like most butterfly plants do. And we have some, some chrysalises here. There we go. Kind of see that a little bit. Some chrysalises. The caterpillars have gone into this phase, and then, uh, in a few weeks, they'll come out of that chrysalis and they'll be the most gorgeous little butterflies. They're, they're purple and black with a little bit of orange. And I don't see any right now, but this Kunti uh, was uh, taken uh, at the turn of the 20th century, between the 19th and 20th centuries, early on in the 20th. It was a form of starch, the roots. And so it was harvested as a for starch in its bulbous root. And so between that and all of the construction here in South Florida, uh, the Kunti just vanished. And with it, the Atala actually was thought to be extinct a few decades ago. And then they found it on one of the Florida Keys and um, and now more and more native gardening centers are offering this kunti for sale for for gardens and with it i mean you see how many caterpillars we have growing here it's hard to believe that this was almost extinct it's such a gorgeous butterfly but kunti uh, is in, it's very slow growing and it's not inexpensive to purchase because it grows so slow and uh, so by the time you get it in transplanting size it's someone's cared for it for a long time but uh, the the atalas sure are gonna there's a whole bunch right they're they're really gonna appreciate that in your garden and so a lot of native garden centers offer this kunti we we aren't growing it yet but that's on our list since it's a great uh, food source for the caterpillar. And so just wanted to show you a little bit more what's here in the garden and introduce you to, to Kunti and encourage you to seek that out for your butterfly garden for the sake of the Atala and its miraculous comeback.